All right, hello. Wow, that's loud. Hi, uh, this is Access Control done right the first time. My name is uh, Tim Clevenger. A little bit about me, I'm a network cybersecurity engineer by day. By night, I'm a low voltage hardware junkie, vintage computing enthusiast. In a previous life, I was certified with Linnell and S2 Access and Video, and I got to drive around in a truck and look at other systems uh, available on the, uh, in, in uh, Southern California. Uh, I'm on the Physical Security Village Discord. My handle's NSFW. No, I will not tell you why it's my handle. A little bit about this talk. Uh, you know, we have a lot of talks about bypasses. My talk is more about the installation of a system. Uh, I'm looking to give some tips and tricks based on the kind of systems that I had seen and had to work on. Uh, a lot of vendors out there, you know, it's a low bid situation and you get a minimal viable product. You know, it kind of does a job, but it's not particularly maintainable, reliable, uh, or even secure. Um, I'm focusing more on large facilities. You know, if you're a small gym with a single door, some of this will apply to you, but maybe not quite as much. Uh, just starting off, I have a, an RFP based on this talk and some other stuff that I've learned. Um, I'll put this QR code up again at the end in case you can't catch it right now. So choosing a system, most uh, of the larger vendors use uh, equipment created by a company called Mercury Security. They're kind of the big gorilla. Uh, they have local storage and independent processing, so you don't have to worry about uh, having to pry open your server room door if your DNS goes down, uh, Facebook. Uh, they have multiple vendor support, and they are reflashable. The cool thing about that is if you decide you're tired of Linnell and you want to go with Genetech or Honeywell, they can reflash the firmware on most of your existing equipment and it reduces the amount of hardware that you have to buy to switch vendors. So a little bit about system layout considerations. So uh, depending on where you're going to do this installation, you'll have a couple of different installation options. I'll start here with kind of a basic four-door layout. So this is a typical enclosure right here. The top board is your access panel that has all the brains of the operation. It makes all of the decisions uh, about whether to let somebody in based on their card number and access rights. The board below it is an additional door controller that's connected. That additional controller doesn't have a lot of brains on its own. It will uh, communicate with that main panel board and that's where the decision happens. What that means is if you lose communication between those two boards, any of those dumber, cheaper door controller boards become suddenly very dumb. They will either lock down, uh, lock open, or they'll just use a facility code to grant access, which isn't always the best as far as security goes. Uh, there's uh, an enclosure here, obviously, that houses all of this. Uh, there's a power supply, and then there are batteries. So when you go to place this uh, enclosure with your panels in it, there are a couple things to consider. You know, uh, kind of the obvious stuff like in, you know environment, uh, heat, humidity, power, uh, physical security. Is this going to be on a wall that people can walk by and pry the you know pry the door open on it? Um, accessibility. You know, is this going to be up in a ceiling somewhere where maybe your batteries aren't going to get changed regularly because you have to get out a long you know step ladder or something? And then the future, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. So for wiring considerations, so the, the main access panel uh, connects to your server computer that runs the software with Ethernet, typically. Uh, Ethernet, as we know, is kind of a shorter range communications uh, medium. Uh, so what they have between your access panel and your individual door controllers is called RS-485. It's an older four-wire communications uh, protocol. Um, theoretically, it's good to 4,000 feet. Um, however, it's much more sensitive to interference than uh, you know, Ethernet or some of the newer uh, communications technologies. There's also there's a foil shield in the wire that you have to deal with. There's termination at the end of a string of devices. So what that means is that RS-485 is substantially, in my opinion, as somebody who's had to go and crawl into spaces and replace wire, it's less reliable over long distances. But we will see in a minute there are some places that you just really don't have a choice. So uh, next up, we think about our distances to doors. So for something like a magnetic lock or a motorized crash bar, that's going to take a lot more amperage than just uh, you know, a kind of a simple uh, relay-based door opener. And if that door also happens to be a long way from where you want to place your panel, 
then you end up with a voltage drop, which causes the locks to either not unlock when you want them to, or in the case of a magnetic lock, the magnet becomes uh, so weak from low voltage that you could just pull the door open anyway. And what will happen is when you go to do your installation, the vendor will figure this out after they've already installed the door and installed the panel and run all the wire, and they'll go, okay, well, we're gonna need to do a remote power supply. And what they'll do is they'll find a place up in the ceiling nearest to the door and put the cheapest power supply they possibly can, not having any consideration for the environment it's gonna be in. It's not gonna have batteries. They're not gonna tell you where it is. It's gonna be up in a soffit where when you do need to get to it, uh, you're like ripping out drywall or something even more expensive. So part of your system layout considerations with your project manager is to say, okay, this door is way over here. Are we gonna need a remote power supply? If so, let's get this going now. Uh, in addition, you know, again, uh, hard lid. So if you got that drywall above your uh, uh, closet where you're going to be doing your installation, that's going to affect your installation. Uh, block walls or concrete walls, like maybe don't put this in a hallway where you're going to have to tunnel through concrete to get all your wiring to your doors. Um, integrity and security, you know, I'm going to make sure that if I'm going to have wiring run from my suite over here through a public hallway to this suite over here above a drop ceiling, maybe I'll put that in conduit so it's not easy to, to get in either tamper with or cut or, you know, other shenanigans. So here's one of the two kind of situations that I'm going to talk about. This is a, you know, a warehouse. We have you know, 65, 70 doors uh, for trucks to back into. And then every few doors you have a person door so that somebody can get in and out of the warehouse. Uh, and you wanna do access control on these. Well, you know, we're talking seven or 800 feet here or maybe more to go from where your access panel might be at the far end across to each one of these drops to these doors. So what you might do is you might go ahead and use that RS-485. You know, it's not in a harsh environment, so it's probably safe to use. It's gonna be exposed there, so if something happens, you can, you can get to it. But it, it allows you to do this without having to run multiple ethernet drops or fiber with media converters or whatever it takes to get ethernet 700 feet down that doorway. Excuse me. Here's a kind of a typical class A office space. You know, this is a floor in pretty much any class A building that you'd be into. So this right here, you know, it's a relatively small space here. What you probably want to do is a centralized panel somewhere near the elevators uh, where you kind of fan out to all of the doors that you need access to from there. But something to consider for the future, you know, there might be, oh, I don't know, a pandemic and suddenly uh, build, uh, companies are trying to get rid of excess space because people are working from home. So if you plan this out ahead of time when you're first moving into the space, you can say, you know what, these are pretty much, you know, they're, they're two half offices essentially. They each have their own elevators, they have their own entrance doors. Maybe I'll go ahead and put uh, a, a panel on each side and then RS-485 to my doors from there. And that way, if for some reason we need to get rid of half of this floor, it's real easy to just put up some drywall cut access to that half of the system and whoever moves in can handle that. So again, it's just something to consider if you're looking at a space, look at how you need to do it today, but also maybe look at the future. This is a, a larger installation. I'm just showing this here for you. Uh, again, power supply, batteries. Here we have the access panel at the top with the ethernet drop and then two door controller boards that are below this. This is kind of, when you're talking about these centralized panel situations, this is what you typically do. You use an enclosure, you have six or eight uh, door controllers, each one can control two doors, and you kind of keep them in one enclosure or two enclosures right next to each other. The RS-485 runs are really short. In this case, it's a pre-wired panel, so you don't even have to mess with it. And it just gives you that kind of extra security to uh, have that there instead of saying, I'm gonna run a door controller way over on the other side of the building, and that means that I'm, that all of that wire from here to there can be a problem in the future. Now let's talk a little bit about wiring to the doors. Uh, some of this is a repeat if you've seen some of the bypass stuff uh, already, but I'll try to warp through that part because I think we've, you know, we know uh, how to bypass some of this stuff. So when you're wiring from your panels to the doors themselves, so, 
uh, some of your wiring considerations. So you're gonna need a, a power, some heavier gauge wires to the door hardware, whatever unlocks the door. Motion sensors are gonna need a power in addition to their contacts. Uh, you're gonna need some kind of shielded cable to the badge reader that could be RS-485 or it could be Wiegand cable. Um, you're going to have your door contact and your uh, request to exit wiring is going to need to go on there. And then it's a good idea to have extra cables, extra um, conductors there for tamper switches, auxiliary inputs and outputs and that type of thing. The wrong way to do this is to let your vendors just decide because what they will do is they will find the cheapest wire, often it's what they have on the truck, and they will run undersized power connectors to doors they think don't need it. Um, you know, that could be a fire hazard in addition to just, you know, having door opening problems. They could use unshielded splice cable. They could use Ethernet or Cat3 telephone wire if that's what they have access to. Um, and that causes communications issues. And then if they don't have those extra conductors in there, that means that in the future, if your receptionist needs a push button to be able to open the door without getting up, I mean, that could involve tunneling under the concrete or up in the ceiling or, you know, it's a lot of extra work that you could have avoided if you had that already pre-wired with those additional conductors. So the right way to do this is to specify composite access control cable. So this is uh, all together in one cable. It's produced by manufacturers who specialize in this. Um, it comes in multiple options depending on how many extra conductors you want, how, you know, what kind of locks you're using. Um, it comes with the right card reader communications cable that's shielded properly, has all the spare conductors, and then it has that thick extra jacket on the outside. So if they're pulling it through a drop ceiling and they just grind you know, the cable against a sharp piece of metal, it's less likely to cause damage to the conductors inside. It's also unique. You know, a thick yellow cable, they're not going to just go cutting through that, you know, with, you know, willy-nilly like they might a bunch of thin uh, white uh, cables. A little bit about power supplies and enclosures. So the way the power works in this situation is typically AC or DC, 12 volts or 12 volts or 24 volts, or a combination of 12 and 24 volts. Your project manager can help you pick the right, uh, right system as far as voltage goes. You want to make sure that they specify one that has a power supply with a charger. Um, batteries are extremely important. The last thing you want is to get locked out of your building when the power goes out because you didn't have batteries on this and all your doors are locked. Um, verify the amperage, amperage and the temperature range. This is particularly important if you're going to be putting that enclosure in a hot room. Um, and then also AC fail and battery fail outputs on the uh, power supply that you can run back to your system and it'll alert you if your batteries are dead or if you're about to, uh, or if you have an AC fail and it's running on batteries, it's good to catch that stuff before your batteries die. Uh, the enclosure, you know, there are different sizes, single or multiple panels in a single enclosure. You can also chain them together so that you can run multiple stuff in, you know, multiple um, enclosures. They're typically sold as a kit with the power supply. So again, make sure that you get that uh, specified to what you need. Um, you can get them pre-wired like the one that we saw a couple slides ago, or you can DIY if you want to wire your own. Um, make sure you get one that has a tamper switch like you can see in the picture here and a key lock so that you can lock that enclosure. If it's gonna be in a public area, go ahead and change the lock on that because all these enclosures have the same key. And then optionally weatherproof, if you've got a parking lot with a gate on it way out in the, you know, at the other end of the property, um, maybe put it in a weatherproof enclosure if you don't have a guard shack or someplace to install the, the panel out there. And then a little bit about batteries. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen either no batteries or dead batteries because they hadn't been changed since the, since the system was installed. They're right in the enclosure, so they're hard to remember sometimes. Um, again, you have to have a power supply with charging capability. What I like to do is write that install date on the battery, so if you're ever in that enclosure in the future, you can look at and see you know, how far ahead those batteries are gonna need to be replaced. Typically, I do it every three to five years. If it's in a nice air-conditioned server room, then I'll replace them every five years. If they're out in a hot you know, uh, garage or something, then I'll replace them every three years. You can usually tell, because when you pick up the battery and shake it, you'll hear rattling because the electrolyte's drying up when the batteries are going dead. And again, use those battery fail outputs. I uh, grabbed this out of a hardware guide. Uh, connect that and run it back to your uh, panels so that you can see when either the batteries are no longer chargeable 
or if the AC has failed, maybe a breaker is tripped somewhere and you need to go take care of that. A little bit about those remote power supplies, again, for those power hungry locks. Um, make sure that you get those specified out ahead of time during the planning phase. That way you know where those are gonna go. You know they're gonna be in a place that you can get to and not have to cut through drywall. You're gonna make sure then that it still has the power supply, the charger and the batteries. You know, having that exterior door on its own power supply with no batteries in it does you no good because that's the door you want to get in when the power goes out. A little bit about fire safety. Uh, your doors, uh, the locking mechanism on your door can be either fail safe or fail secure. What that means is if your access system crashes and it does happen, you, you want to know whether you can actually get out of the building or not. If it fails secure, then that door is not going to open when the software is crashed. If it's fail safe, then the door is going to go unlocked. Now, there's different reasons that people would choose a fail safe versus a fail secure, depending on what you're protecting. I would just say that if you choose to do something that is a fail secure, make sure that people who are in that room can get out in the case of a fire, a power outage, a software crash. It's not worth life safety to protect assets. Find another way to do it. Uh, make sure that your system is going to comply with the local fire code and the authority having jurisdiction. That's sometimes a fire marshal, sometimes it's a building inspector, it depends on your jurisdiction. Um, and also if you're particularly in a class A building, you may be required by your lease to tie your system into a building fire alarm using a relay like one of these that opens the door or unlocks the lock when the fire alarm goes off. Uh, again, make sure that you take care of that. And then finally, there's a box in the US at least on the outside of most of these buildings. It's called a Knox box. It's a little hardened metal box that uh, the fire department can open up to get a key into the building. I typically will put a badge in there because I don't have keys, we don't do keys. But if you do, make sure that's in there. I strongly recommend that you put a tamper switch in that so that if somebody uses the probably well-known uh, Knox box common keys out there, that you know that that's uh, been tampered with. Uh, a little bit about door hardware. Um, I'm not gonna go through these. These are you know pretty standard. Um, the electrified strike is the one that you see here. That's that one that makes the nasty buzzing sound and the door never closes quite right. Um, solenoids uh, are the more common ones that you see on office doors. The only thing with those is if your door is set to stay open 8 to 10 or 12 hours a day, that solenoid is staying engaged that entire time, and those things can fail prematurely, and then you can't open the door. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Um, magnetic locks <clears throat> typically need more power than standard locks because the electromagnet magnet requires that voltage in order to have the holding power. Um, and those will always fail safe. So maybe don't use those for your front doors because uh, if the power goes out, they're gonna open. And then finally, motorized crash bars, which I've only seen in one place, but they're expensive, but they're, they're pretty good. Uh, so quick thing about door, con uh, door hardware. So you have two sensors on a door typically. You'll have the door contact that tells you whether the door, the door is open or closed. That can be uh, a read switch. Uh, up in the door frame, it can be uh, integrated into the lock set itself. Uh, and then the request to exit, that's what tells the, the access control system that this door is being opened legitimately from the inside by the correct person and not being jimmied open from the outside. So it detects if that door is being forced or bypassed and it still allows the door to open from the secure side. Um, there's also in cases where you have, for instance, a mag lock, that request to exit switch will actually unlock the door because there's not really any other way to do it. Um, and then typically your other options are a button, a buzzer, a motion detector, or a switch integrated into the handle for your recs. The reason I mention these is because we need to talk a little bit about supervision. Supervision is a set of resistors in series or parallel that need to be as close to the door contact or Rex contact as possible. And what they do is they change your situation from either these wires are open or closed, the circuit is open or closed. It gives you now four different readings depending on whether the door is open, the door is closed, or if the wires are cut or the wires are shorted. And that's very important because the last thing you need is a door contact falling off and then people could just open the door and go in and out and you don't know what's happened. Uh, motion detectors, um, 
again, there's attack examples here. We've talked about this quite a bit. You can come to the Physical Security Village and we'll, we'll talk you through it. Um, they're often used to trigger and unlock, again, on motion, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, mag lock doors and some other types. So not only do they, uh, are they a security risk, but they can actually open the door if you can bypass them. And then door handle attacks. Uh, I know that we just had a presentation on this. Some of those mitigations, you know, dual recs. So you have to have something where they pull the door handle on the inside and there's a motion detector or a second badge reader or a push button. Again, if you're going to use a badge reader to exit, make sure you have a way to get out. Uh, typically, you get one of those plastic covers that you rip off and pull the handle and it'll let you out while also setting off an alarm. That's what that's for is so that you can get out in case of a, of a fire and you don't happen to have your badge. A uh, little bit about badges and readers. So, you know, badges come in multiple sizes and shapes. You know, you got the fobs, you got the smart card readers. If you're from the 80s, you got mag stripe cards, like there's all kinds. Um, additional factors, biometrics and pin entry. Uh, this thing here is called a scramble pad. It's cool. Every time you hit the button, all the numbers are in a different order. So people watch you put your pin in and they still can't figure out what it is. Um, the badges, the, the most common types of badges, um, 125 kilohertz procs, that's what your gym gives you. Uh, 1356 megahertz I-Class are what you typically get in an office situation. They're pretty trivially, trivially broken and clonable. The MyFair Desfire and the CEOs are not broken directly, but there are uh, downgrade attacks on those. Um, Prox and I-Class, they have a facility code and a badge ID in a 26-bit uh, format. The facility code is 0 to 255, uh, and you can buy any badges from eBay or any other vendor with whatever um, facility code that you want. Uh, so for instance, most of the places that I've worked, for whatever reason, and this is Texas, California, Utah, the code 132 is the most common facility code. I have no idea why. But if you bought a batch of 132 codes or cards from, uh, from eBay and just walked up to a random building, you have a fair chance of getting in. Um, the Again, the 26-bit Prox and I class is pretty trivial. Any compatible reader can read it. So you can just go buy an HID reader off of eBay, attach it to uh, an ESP32, touch your badge to it. It'll give you the facility code and then the badge number. Um, you can also do portable readers. Uh, I know we've had talks about, um, you know, the, the clipboard thing where you put, the, put a, a badge reader in your clipboard and you just read people's badges with it. So the solution is custom badges. Um, like I said, I, there are, there's the MyFair ones. I've never used those. I've only used the HIDs. So uh, they have a format, <clears throat> excuse me, a format called uh, HID Corporate 1000. It's uh, COs protected, so it's more secure. It has a dedicated facility code. When you sign up, your company gets its own facility code because there's uh, millions of possibilities. Um, and then only you can order more cards with that particular facility code. They use a 48-bit format. So for each facility code, you can have 8.3 million badge numbers, which is cool because you can pick a number in the high range and not worry about if you acquire another company, those badge numbers um, coinciding with somebody else's. Uh, I'm going to warp through this real quick because my time's out. Uh, make sure you disable older formats on your readers. That's the downgraded. Uh, badge reader communications, Wigan, it's a low speed protocol from 1975. Um, the mitigation is called OSDP. OSDP has very few compromises um, that are pretty easy to avoid. The biggest problem with OSDP is that 84% of installers never or seldom use it. So it's almost never used these. And this is from 2015. So. Uh, so what else should I do? Test your regulars, yeah, test your readers regularly. Um, set up alerts in your software. Again, so many people have software and they've never set up alerts in it. Document everything. I put a sticker on the bottom of every reader that has a number and I match that number to my access control system. So when they say reader number 24 is not working, I can just go fix it. Um, check your batteries. Uh, batteries die, they don't do you any good. Audit your user list regularly and then um, Come visit us in the Physical Security Village. I'm actually going to be volunteering over there right after this if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much.